Yeah, so the presentation I was supposed to give, and I will give it, don't worry, is the one about MTL, uh, which is a fancy name for something which is, isn't really that fancy, but it's awesome. Um, but I'm also preparing a talk for a conference which will happen in Poland next week. And, and I think this talk is sort of like an introduction you want to have before you actually will learn about stuff about MTL. So I have right now a quiz, so you will just raise your hand. You can do two things. We can either have a one talk about MTL, and it's going to be like about like 30, maybe 40 minutes altogether, just MTL. Or you can have MTL, but before you will have MTL, you will have a talk which I call, it's a, right now a, a call the, the power of abstraction, which is not finished, but gives us the, like a background and understanding for anything else in functional programming and all that. And that might take additional 20 to 30 minutes. So option A, just MTL, maximum 40 minutes. Or option B, the power of abstraction and MTL, but this might be like an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. So option, option, option A, just MTL, raise your hand. All right, and option B, uh, okay. <laughs> For the two unfortunate guys, oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so I don't have a clicker, so I will have to use uh, space tab, and oh, it should be fine. Okay, so the power of abstraction, which which sounds fancy, but it really isn't. So let me show you my little little toolbox. And in that toolbox, I have a method, um, which is uh, this is like very simple example length, right? I take it is basically a function that takes a string and it gives me back an integer, and just so you know, my examples, I tend them to be easy so we can actually focus on, 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 on the real problem. Um, if, if I were to bring some more fancy examples, then everything would be just all of a sudden very complex and weird. So, so keep in mind, it's not functional programming. It's not really to write easy stuff. You can actually write more complex stuff as well. But given the fact that I have right now an hour and maybe 10 minutes, it, I just want to stick with something simple. So now I have a function that goes from string to integer. Awesome. And, and I want to have a function that will use that function. So here I have a method which takes a parameter a string, supposed to give me an integer, and it's basically calling that function that I, I created before. Awesome. And I have a, here a main method, we'll just basically call that function, and, and if I run it on my, on my REPL, it gives me the result I was hoping to get, which is five. Awesome. But now my colleague comes to me and he's like, well, to be honest, it's, it's not going to be really string. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be an option, right? Could you, could you refactor your code? And I'm like, okay, not a problem, right? I mean, I could still do what? I can, it's an option. I will go through documentation. I will find there's a map method that I could use, right? I could just call map on my option and, and use the function that goes from string to integer. And right now my function gives, instead of giving an integer, gives me an option of F integer. <laughs> Supposedly, Everything compiles and it works and it gives me a value close within an option. Great. <sighs> but I hate my colleagues at work. And they're like, no, it, it's not really an option, really. Oh, we forgot to tell you it's actually a disjunction. This disjunction is like an either type for Scala Z, so it's like left or right. Uh, and you're like, eh, okay, you're fine because you only have to do change the type signature because also the uh, disjunction has a map method. So right now you just change the, the type signature of length operation and everything compiles and everything runs and gives you the proper value. But then they come back and tell, sorry mate, it's not really disjunction, it's right now task because, okay, so task, is, if people aren't familiar with task, task is like a future in Scala Z, but the difference is if you get a future a future of end, right? You got it, you got the value, it probably is already cal calculating your whatever calculation is doing, fetching that values from database or whatever. Maybe it's already here, maybe it's still, maybe still the CPU is running. With task, it's something different. You get task of end until you run it, until you me call method like, there are many methods you can call it. One of them would be unsafe perform sync. It will, until you do it, it will not run anything. It'll just, it's just a value, like a recipe of what should be done. So, so, but think of it like a future plus plus. So, then, so now they give you a string close over task and you're supposed to give them integer close over task as well. And you sort of, you sort of see there's a pattern here and you, the only thing that you, you've been doing for the past few hours at your work was ch changing type signature, anything that's basically stupid. So, well, you can run it, it compiles and gives you a value back, awesome. But you sort of right now start to think, could I do this a little bit better? Could I just say, uh, there's gonna be some F. 
So f here is a type constructor. It's not really a type, right? It's like, like option. Option is not a type. Option of string is a type. Uh, option is just a constructor for your, for your type. So here f can be any type constructor that has a one single hole here in it. And we're going to get our string closed over that f, whatever that f is going to be. And we will give the integer back closed over that f as well. That would be cool, right? If we could just call it with option, throwable, uh, sorry, like a task or a disjunction or whatever. Can we implement it right now? Is it possible? Not really, because we made this whole thing signature too abstract. It's, it's just we, we lost all the information that we could use because it, it can be any f. We have absolutely no idea what that f is. We only know it's, it's a type constructor and all that, uh, and we cannot really do anything about it. Fortunately, there's a, there's a type class, and, and if people are not familiar with what, not th what type class is, I mean, eh. uh, you should. Uh, just <laughs> uh, but basically, the idea, okay, so like, okay, type class one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if, if, if your type is basically a set of values, uh, a type class will be set of types. So it's, it's like, a, like a VIP club. You, you create a type class, you define some functions, and you'll say, any type can join like anyone, as long as you provide implementations for those functions I just described here. You provide this, you're good. You're good in my club. If you don't, then you know, get out of here. So basically, a functor is one of those type classes. And you're supposed to provide only one single method, map. So the map has a signature given. You have some value of type A closed over F. And you have a function that goes from A to B. It will give you the F of B. That's the contract that you have. Right? The functor is telling anyone can join my, my functor club. Right? You provide me the map implementation and you're good for your type, for where the, where the type is going to be, where the type is going to be that f. So, so if we constrain our f here to be a functor, then one more time we can have the same implementation as we had before, because we magically get this map function for free from the functor the way that, that Scala Z is implemented, the same was implemented in the cats. Uh, so right now we have something pretty, pretty cool because no longer we are like concentrated on a single type option or, or, or task or disjunction. We say anything, as long as you provide me this, as long as you implement that map method for me, you can use my function with any type whatsoever. So, so for example, here we, we see there's a, there's a string, there's an option, there's, a, there's an error, and there's also possibility to fetch some values, I don't know, from database or, or something like that. We could call our function right now with an option. And um, for people who don't see it, like this method is right now being called with an option and with that argument, maybe string. We could call it with that. This will compile and it will work and it will give us an option back with that integer. We could call it with, so we have a, a, a return type over here. We could call it with task as well. We could, well, what about throwable? Like, what about string error here, the guy over here? Now, this guy is a little bit tricky, right? Because this junction, functor supposedly takes one hole, one single, you can, you can construct a type of a single um, uh, parameter here, but, but uh, this junction has left side and right side. So we have to sort of like fill, like partially apply one of the sides, either left or the right. So we want to we want to partially apply it with throwable. We want to say any type that's going to be like a disjunction where throwable is on the left hand side. So vanilla way to do it in Scala is is horrible because it looks like this and it's blah, right. But fortunately, there's a macro for it called kind projector, and kind projector does all that ugliness for you. It's basically you write your you partially apply your type. So you, I, I'm putting here throwable on the left hand side. And I just put question mark on the right hand side, and macro magically will create that, 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 that ugliness that we see a moment before. And, and we get our value back. And uh, what, about, what about string? The question would be could we still use that function with just vanilla string, like a, like a type not really close under, in, inside anything? Well, fortunately, fortunately in Scala Z and Cats as well, you get a type ID. It's, it's like a little trick, it's a type alias. Uh, parameterized by A, which gives you that A back. And, and so you can just call length operation with ID and it will take string and it will just work, which is awesome. Now, what about, what, what if I have a function that looks a little bit more complicated? 
And it's not really complicated. The only complication here is that we got right now two arguments. Instead of having a function from one argument and a value, now we have two arguments and they give us a value. And as you can see, they just sum two integers together. Now, if I were to write a function like plus operation, as we write, written one here before. So I have my, my f1 argument and f2 arguments. They are closed over some f, right? Could I use my plus function here to give the, the sum, the plus of those two, closed over that f? Well, can I? Yes or no? Unfortunately, no. We could, well, we, could, we could try something tricky, like we could, what we could do, the problem is that if you have map in functor, it, it, the map only takes one parameter, so it takes functions with one parameter, like the one that we had just a moment ago, right? Map here only takes a function that has a one single parameter to give you value, but here we have a function that takes two arguments. We could do a trick. We could say, okay, so, we could take plus function and carry it. Who's not familiar with it? I will ask a random person, and the person doesn't know has to do push up. Okay, cool. Uh, so, so carry is a pretty simple idea. And if I have a function that takes two arguments and gives me a value, if you call carry on it, it will give you an equivalent function. By equivalent, I mean isomorphic, meaning it will just give you the same results. But it's, it, the only difference will be it will be just a one argument function that as a result give you a function that will take a second argument and finally give you a value. So plus takes two arguments, gives you a result, right? Integer plus integer. If I carry it, what I have here, the signature, will be a function that will just take the first integer, but as a result it will give me a function that takes an integer and gives me a result, okay? So now I just, I just using carried here, I now get a function that takes one argument, which is great because this is what I actually need for my map. But now I have this value, this, this, this other argument here close over f, but it's not really that argument, it's, it's already that function, it's that, that, that value, right? That function that goes, and, and I have to apply my second value to it, and, I, and there is no way to do it. I mean, you can try, and if you do, I buy you a beer. Crap, I, I will buy you a whiskey if you do it with that signature. Um, it's, it's, it's basically impossible. So we have to work, look for something else. One more time, our signature, even we were try to be as abstract as possible at this point, it's, it's too abstract. We don't have enough knowledge to implement this function. So we need to lose our constraints a bit. And so instead of using functor, we will look for something which is called apply. And apply is one more type class. It is a functor, so it already has a map function, but it, it also gives you one more function called AP from apply. AP takes two things. Takes a function from A to B and is closed over some F and it's giving us that A, which is closed over F. So we have a function, and we want to apply argument to that function, but both function and the argument are closed over F. And this will magically apply that argument for us, give us the value B closed over that F. If you, if you look at what we had here just a moment ago, this is exactly what we had, right? We have a function that is closed over F, we have our second argument that we want to apply here, and we, if we had that app functionality, we could just apply that f2 to, to that temp and it would just work. So that's what, what we can do. We can say right now, we constrain our f with apply. So now we can call uh, that ap function with f2, with temp, and it compiles, and it hopefully works. And here we have an example that works with an option. So, so we, we call it with an option and, give, and, and sort of like the, the example here, we have two integers, 10 and 20. Uh, we, we call our plus operation where we parameterize by option and option has an instance for apply. And so hopefully the value that we will get back, it will be option of integer where those two integers are summed together. And, 
And if we call those arguments, this is the value that we get back. Now, before I move on, um, because I, I know I've been try I'm trying to speak really, really, really fast right now, and maybe I lost some people, uh, which was probably stupid uh, on my side. Uh, the general idea here was that instead of uh, fixing ourselves on a concrete type, we would like to keep us as, as abstract as possible and only give as much information as needed, nothing else. So in terms of we were, we were calling just a single function like length operation, we only needed functor. Functor was not enough if we were, call, uh, if we were using function that takes two arguments, we needed to use apply. But our, our functionality here can work with anything, of any type, as long as it has this constraint. It has an instance for an apply type class. So now we sort of, there's this inversion of control because now you, the user of your functionality can choose whether it's gonna be whatever type they want. They have the flexibility to work with your function that you're providing. And you don't really have to write libraries for take advantage of, of, this, of this little thing in here. Uh, um, there's there's a uh, one trick. Yeah, let me show you it. Um, so if we if we actually look at the apply type class, you will you will find a method called apply to that actually does this thing for us. So it carries the function. So it takes takes the first argument. It takes the second argument. It takes a like a pure function that goes like it's a and b and gives us some c, and it just applies the a and b to that function, it's basically doing what we were doing just a moment ago, it's, it's exactly the same functionality. So we could, so in our example, instead of do, doing all, all that, we, we could just call that, um, uh, that apply to. Now apply to, as you can imagine, has this Scala issue, meaning like if now, supposedly I have a third argument, right? I'll have to add F3 here, and I'll just have to rename it to apply free. And, and if I have four arguments, apply four, and, and it continues. And it's not really, really that fun. So there is a trick that you can use. And if you were ever uh, reading um, like an introduction to Scala Z because you want to know what the hell the Scala Z is all about, why people are freaking out, what the hell, and you most probably run into two examples. One was explaining like functor stuff like this. I'm like, I'm not doing or somebody was explaining you how to use validation with Scala Z. And then you see this weird operator, which I call scream operator. Um, and you were like wondering, what the hell? And, and we will try to understand why we use this operator. Because this operator is really a trick. Um, this works, yeah. It, operator is really a trick. It's, called, it's, it's closed over the apply syntax. And it's basically, you know, this scream. Right, and, um, so you have your f of a, which is uh, apply, you have your f of b as well, and if you, you, call, you call a fun this, this weird uh, function here with, with that operator here, it creates you something which is called applicative builder. And if we look at the applicative builder, the insights of applicative builder, the applicative builder that you built from those two guys together, so you have f1, f2, and you concatenate them like you call this, this scream function on them, it will give you this applicative builder with a function apply, which basically calls apply to, right? But if on that thing you call one more time a scream operator, it will give you applicative builder free. As you can imagine, applicative builder free will call uh, apply free and so on and so forth. So there's a little bit this ugliness hidden within the library. The, the general idea here is instead of calling just apply to, you could, you could, say, you could say this. Um, the first argument, the second argument, and take values closed over that f from f1, so take this integer, take that integer, and call this function on those two integers. That's basically sort of what it's doing. Um, and, and it's just, that's just a little bit nicer syntax. Um, and we could, we could go on with like, um, with, with, creating issues, right? For example, one of the issues could be, and don't worry, I know there's not much oxygen here. You guys might be falling asleep, so I'll try to wrap it up as, as soon as I can. Uh, there's one, one little obstacle I, I created for, for this meetup. Uh, the obstacle would be, 
Right now we get an F1 and F2, they are both closed over F. But what happens if one of the arguments is actually not closed over F? One is F1, the first argument for the function is closed over F, and the second one is just, just the integer, right? Can we do something about it? Can we, can we, can like, we, we, we sort of need to, so like lift this integer here to that F. Can we do it right now? One more time, the answer is no, because one more time, this is too abstract. We created a, a, a one more constraint, one more problem, uh, and, and, the, and the, so the, the type signature that we have is too, too abstract one more time. We need something more concrete. And, there, and this, there's, a, there's a one more type class called applicative, uh, and applicative, if you look at it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's apply, so it's a type class apply. As you remember, apply is a functor, right? So now you get both apply and a functor, and, it's, and it just gives you one more function, point. And a point just takes any value that you have, like here an integer, and it will close that value over that f. If, you, if you're new to type classes, you've never seen type classes before, don't try to think, how that magic happens. That's the beauty of functional programming. You don't really care. As long as your type signature checks, as everything compiles, most probably it will work. So I'm, like some, yeah, most probably. Um, uh, uh, somebody who will provide instance for, it, for this type class, for your type F, whatever that, that, that type F might be, it might be an option, either option T, state, whatever that, that, that something here is gonna be at this point, they have to figure out how to impl implement that method, right? When I'm writing my function, when I'm writing this, when I'm writing this, that's the beauty of it. At all the complex stuff, I'm pushing to the user. It's called invention of control. I, I sort of care for my user who will be using my function. I don't really care about my user. I just, I just push all the crapness to him, right? I don't know how to lift your value to f, you do it. That, that's what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm constraining right now, it's not gonna be apply, it's gonna be applicative. At this point I'm saying, you know what? You give me a first argument close over f, the second argument is, is like an integer, it's not close over f, well, if you give me this, then sorry, you need to give me information how to lift your integer to your, to your f. And this is what point is doing. Just a reminder here, point, took any a, like a in our example is an integer, and gave, gives us an f of a, in our example, f of an integer. We don't care and don't know how that magic happens. The only thing that we do know is that it happens. The, the type system with the compiler, they will guarantee that if somebody will call your function plus operation with whatever type f, that f will need to have an instance of applicative, which means they need to implement map from functor, ap from apply, and also point from applicative. They need to have it. Luckily, for most of our types that we use, Scala that already provides those instances, so we don't really have to, have to care. But, um, but yeah, so we could go on, and, and the talk I'm preparing for, for the conference sort of go on. I, I'm gonna stop here. I just wanna show you one more cool thing. And because the, the beauty of having abstraction, the one that we've seen so far was the ability, this, this inversion of control. You tell me what the type you, you're gonna be using with. I will not make the decision up front because I don't know. Maybe you will use it with option, maybe you will use it with either type, maybe you will use both, right? This gives us this ability to tell the user, well, you decide. But is this, this is, is it the only like, positive side effect that we have from abstraction? Fortunately, it isn't. And, and I hope I will show you one more cool thing from using the uh, code that is a little bit more abstract. Can anyone tell me what this function is doing? I will buy you beer if you know. I will give you a hint. If, for people who don't, it sounds to integers together. You have a comment, you, so but it, should, it should be fixed. Right? So do you know? Any guess? Well, as it turns out, it subtracts two integers from each other. The problem is, people are, 
sort of our industry grown to the level that we make fun of comments. But to be honest, the name of your function is also a comment. It's just a name, right? It could be some compiler will not care. You could call it whatever. And the compiler will be happy with the implementation that we have over here. All right, so let's try to make a little bit more this more abstract and see what it will give us. Um, just to give you just uh, like an example here, the possible solution that we could have. So, so what I'm doing here is I have my sum. Right now, it's no longer it's no longer an integer, right? We, because we used to have an integers. Right now, we're making this a little bit more abstract. So. Uh, Previously, if we had integers, we could just return zero. We could return a1 and a2. We could one, two, three, whatever constant value. We could perform some operations, whatever the imagination is. Now, if we have this signature, like we're saying there's a function sum, which is parameterized by a, and we take a1 and a2, which are of the type a, and we're supposed to give a back. And we, we, let's, let's keep in mind that we really want to implement the sum functionality. That's, that's our goal. Like, is it enough information that we have? Not really, because it's, it's too constrained. Because we could still make this compile. We could say, we could either return a1 or we could return a2. And by the way, what I mean by that is that I'm, using, I'm, I'm trying to stay in the functional programming paradigm, meaning I will not throw exceptions, create like random values or whatever. I try to stay in, in, in pure functional programming paradigm. So those are the only two things that we could do, either return a1 or return a2. Not enough. Well, we could constrain our A with a yet another type class called semigroup. And semigroup, I think I don't have a slide for it. So semigroup is a type class that is telling you, listen, any type, any type can be a member of, of semigroup. Two conditions apply. You need to provide an app, append function. So I have two values of A's. I can sum them together, meaning they will give me an A back. And there's also a constraint on law, which is associativity law. So if you add A and B together and then C, it doesn't, the order doesn't matter. You can add A and B and then C, or you can add A, B and C together and then A. Those are the two constraints. And when you once you have it, you can, you can use this operator plus over here. And we have our functionality uh, the way we want it to, uh, it to have. But now the difference is, well, it's still inversion of control. I still, right now I can still, not only I can use it with integer, I can use it with double, I can use it with anything that, um, that has this constraint, like a tree or, or any data structure that, you, that basically can, can be uh, merged together by summing two elements together. Um, so the possible uh, set of solutions are actually three solutions that you can have. You can either return a1, a2, or uh, the sum that we are returning. So the constraint, really, really, like the constraint that we have, not only gives us this inversion of control, but also uh, really constrains the possible set of solutions that you ha can have within your implementation, which is, which is really, really neat idea if you think about it, because the number of bugs that you can have in your code decrease really, really, really fast. And it's, it's a really, really cool thing. I can actually show you one more thing. Maybe quickly. Um, so imagine that I have, let, let's, say I, let's say I have this, uh, this sum one more time. But this time, what I'm taking is I'm taking a list, and it's going to be a list of integers, OK? And what I want to have right now here is, a uh, is, is an integer back. So one of the implementations that I could, I could do, and, and this is basically the, the one I wanted to have, is, is called fold. I will start with zero value. And whenever you have some arguments, two arguments from that list, sum them together. So now this is a valid implementation, right? This is just using fold as it is, should work. But the, with this signature, the number of possibilities that you can create is enormous. Because you're turning an int. You could, you could take the first element from the list. You could take the second element from the list. You could return a constant value. You could return some arbitrary calculations. You, there are, there are really a number of, you could return just zero, like, a, like a, this uh, natural element. Number of elements, that, that, um, ways you could implement this function where a compiler will not complain is enormous. But what happens if I do this trick? Well, let's, let's try to make this uh, 
a little bit more abstract. So I can first abstract on, on integer. I would just say, no, it's not really an integer, it's a nay, okay? It's a nay. So this, this will not compile, right? Obviously, because we don't know what an A is. We need to have a way to sum it. And we already know how to sum two things together. We will just say it's a semigroup. Uh, awesome. But so now we can use we can use this operator sum, but we still miss the, this zero. Well, fortunately, there's something which is called uh, monoid. And monoid is a semigroup. Hey, monoid, monoid is a semigroup with one more additional thing, with that zero element for your calculations. So now I could say, now I could say monoid, uh, monoid for my, for my A, zero, it will give me zero back. And now it will work, previously worked with integers. Now it work with, will work with anything as long as you can provide type class monoid for that thing, right? But we are not done. We are using less. Why less? The, the people who believe in Craftsman Manifesto, they're really, really angry with functional programming people because we use all those variables like F and G and H and all like that. It's, it's not, we don't do it because we're stupid. The reason we do it because we don't really know enough information about our types to actually fixate on a single name. So here you have a name list, which sort of makes sense because it is a list, but I don't want it to be a list. I wanted this to be a whatever. I just want to say whatever. Uh, and, and so I'm saying my A is not going to be held within a list. It can be held with it within anything. So now I will no longer call this a list. I will just call it an F. So it's not any F really. It's an F that is foldable. So foldable, if we, if we go to Scala Z and we look for foldable, we will see it's, it's another, another, yet another type class that has a single method that you have to implement fold map. So whatever type, you just have to implement this fold map method and you get an instance. And one of the things that you can get is, if we look for it, is this. It's a function called fold. And it's saying, if you have f of m and m is a monoid, I will know how to, how to fold your thing. So now, go back to our implementation. Our implementation at this point is going to look like this. Fold. That's all. That's all. Uh, sorry. Uh, that's all. <laughs> and this is beautiful, because if you think about it one more time, the possible set of solutions, there are only two things you can do. You can either return a zero for monoid. That will also give you an A or you can fold it, nothing else. And, and, and you might be saying, but I, I'm gonna use it with list. Awesome, you will use it with list, but list gives you too much information. There's so much information within list. All the methods, all the functionalities that list holds. And you don't really care at this point it's a list. You only care that you can actually fold this structure. And you can use it with tree, you can use it with anything that folds, which, which holds value as what values that are of this type. Which I think is awesome. Um, I have other cool examples I would love to show, but I, I promise I will do MTL. And, and if you're interested, I will be here around. I'll be drinking beer today probably, so I have my laptop with me. But let's go back to a, a different presentation, which is, which is the MTL. OK. How are you feeling? Polish dude, talking about crazy stuff. And it's going to get crazier, I promise. But Stay with me, right? I'll try to make it entertaining. I can dance, you know, whatever, whatever keeps you alive. So MTL, okay, so MTL, it's, a, it's a, from a conference. So I'm using Scala Z, but basically the concepts, you could, we will find them in CATS as well, so don't worry about it. Uh, MTL states for Monet Transformers Library, and you may be like, oh, Monet Transformers, I already know what that is. It's not really about Monet Transformers. It's something that originated from the separate library back in the days in Haskell world from Monet Transformers, but it's a different thing. It's, it's basically a set of patterns that they found reoccurring over type classes. So type classes were supposed to give us some functionality like functor, applicative, but then they realized there are a few type classes that are doing different things, but they have similar patterns that are reoccurring and we could, we could abstract over this pat those patterns. And, and I'm, I know it sounds weird, so just let me show you an example. How many of you guys seen this game? 
Raise your hand. Okay, two people. You should really play this game. It's an amazing simulator where you sort of play like a CEO of a startup in San Francisco, and the game will, will throw at you events to which you sort of have to react. And depending of how you're going to react to those events, you will either will get money or lose money, or you will get happiness within your company, or you lose happiness within your company. It's an amazing game. If, if you want to if you want to look it up, uh, I, I honestly recommend it. Um, so we're going to do something like that. We're going to be a, 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 a startup, but our startup will be more sci-fi. We'll, we will run startup within the galaxy far, far away. And we are lucky because we are, have our first client. Not only we have our first client, it's a client from government, so good money, right? So, so there's this guy. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, he's an awesome dude, like, uh, and uh, they, they, they were having a very, uh, they, they were running an application, like a monolith application, which was very successful, but one of their developers went to this conference and came back and said they should decompose that to microservices, and, and this thing happened. So now they run short of money, and, and since like whatever government does when they run out of money, they raise taxes, right? So we were supposed to write an application that will uh, give us ability to calculate how much, uh, how each citizen should uh, give, um, how much tax they should give from their income. Fortunately, the calculation is pretty straightforward. We take the income, we subtract five, five we leave for the citizen, everything else is a tax. So right now, you're supposed to write this with this function tax calculator with this method income, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's uh, like, we will do whatever every startup uh, does when they actually start as a startup. So we will acquire a different startup. And this is what we did. So we acquired a different startup and they have a function minus five. And that function basically is doing what, what we are supposed to have in our logic. So it takes an integer, it subtracts five. Um, there's a rule if the value is bigger than five, it will, it will throw an exception. So now, well, well, we could just use it, right? Job's done. We could, we could write a main function, so we take an argument from args, we, like if people from the back there have like seats up front, if you don't see it, because I, this, this, this font is gonna be that big, so, so don't worry about it, like, like there are like a few more rows, a few more chairs here up front. Um, so basically we can just use this function, but if we do, if we go to our SBT and if we run this function with two arguments, 10 and four, well, fortunately for 10, we will get the result back, but for four, we, we have an exception. The application crashes. It's not looking, looking very good. Iteration one, demo on Friday, and client is not happy. So, so what can we do about it? Well, the easiest way is sort of deal with that exception as, well, one of the ways you could actually do it is just close your calculations over try, right? So it will, it, you will write the, uh, um, run your, your functions from our library, we'll close the value of a try, and then in the main function, we can pattern match. And if you have a success, we will give you a value. If there was an error, we will give you a message back. Well, awesome. And we will run it and, and sort of it works. But now, if we think about it, is try really the only way how we could deal with errors? Well, not really. Like you could, for example, close everything within task. Task also has the ability to deal with errors. There's, a, there's like here, the, like you, the, the first thing that we do is we, we, have, um, we have a value closed over, over task and we map it to string and there's a handle with method. So it's basically like a, takes a partial function. If, if it finds an, an error, here we, we're pattern matching on every exception that can happen, we will give that, we will just give a value back. We, we just take the message and, and give us give the value back, and it's sort of like if we if we run it if we run it it uh, it sort of works and gives us whatever that we we needed. But it's not the only way that we could deal with, with errors. We could also people might use uh, disjunctions more probably or either type right either in type and disjunction. Probably most people will will use uh, either type. So you will you will say I I will either give you an error on the left hand side here the error will be just a throwable or I will give you the value. And, and one more time, we can pattern match against values, and one more time, it will work. And, and the problem is exactly the same as we've seen uh, in the presentation that we had just a moment ago. We, one more time, uh, fix ourselves as the implementation implementators of the given function 
on the type without taking into the consideration how that function is going to be used. Right now, somebody might be using it with either type, but somebody else in the near future might use it with option, or you might not even know how it's going to be used. So, so the thing that you really want to do is sort of, one more time, do that inversion of control. So you want to you wanna say, you know what? Um, I will give you that f, right? Uh, that integer, sorry, close over some f, but you decide what that f is option or, 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 or either type or whatever, because we, option might be as well. I think we had an option as examples as well where, where we just can simply ignore the error if it happens. So can we implement it right now? Well, not really, because it's still one more time to abstract, fortunately. And I mean, yeah, we could, we could, we could use applicative, the, the one that we, we, we learned just a moment ago. There's this, this point method that we've seen. Uh, so we could pattern match, so we could we could just, you know, we will take an integer. We will, we will, uh, we will uh, call try on the, our function, and if it's a success, we have ability to lift our value to that f. We want to give the user value close over the f, but the user is choosing choosing what the f is going to be. We might constrain f of, on applicative, so if we actually have a success, we can just say the re result, that point, and we're lifting our integer to that f, and at this point, we don't really know what f is. Can be an option, can it be either type, it will work. But what about failure? We don't have enough information to create an f, because we always have to return an f. If we have a value, the value will be closed over f, awesome. But if the error happened, we, st we still need to return an f. So we need to have a type that will be able to deal with errors. So fortunately, there is, in Scala Z, a type class called monad error. And monad error is sort of constrained on two types. One of the f, so whatever that f is gonna be, and the s is the type of the error, whatever the, the type of the error might be. And we have two um, useful uh, functions. The one that we're gonna be focusing on is called rise and error. So, sorry, rise and error gives us ability to, so given there is some kind of error of type S, right, whatever that error is, I will create you an F of A. One more time, you don't care how the magic happens. You get this for free. You have the given the error, have the ability to lift, to create the type of F of A. So, so in our example, what we will do is instead of constraining that f on applicative, we will constrain this on monad error. So right now, if failure happens, if failure happens, we, so failure in our type, in our example, failure, failure is of type, um, uh, um, of the, uh, sorry, the, the error type is of type uh, throwable, right? So, so this e is throwable, so we can call rise and error, and this thing, will give us the f back, the f that we want to have. Um, because, sorry, because as you remember, this is the method that we have within the type class. Now, you might wonder, what about point, right? What about point? We, 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 just, um, we just erase applicative. Well, fortunately, if you look at the monad error signature, you will see it extends monad, and we didn't cover that, but monads basically, they, they also extend applicative, so you get point as well for free. So if you have this constraint, you also get point in your type signature. So, so one more time, in this implementation, we're saying, okay, so you give us an integer, we will run the calculation, the business logic, right? And the value will be closed over some f. You decide what the f is, you. I don't care. But for me to implement this, for this to compile, you need to provide me this. That's the only thing I need, that the instance of the type class monad error where there are two functions that you have to implement. Once you implement it, we're good. And one more time, for majority of types like option, either and all that, Scala Z already implements that for you, so you don't really have to do it. But, but check this out. I can call my income tax with, with error, where, where error is throwable or, or A, so basically call it with, with, with a disjunction, it will compile and work. I can call it with task, it will compile and work. I can, I can run it here, 
and it gives me the right results. Um, the right results. Now, I cannot really call it with option and try because uh, there are no type uh, instances for monad error in Scala that for both option and try. But you know, we can go crazy and we can just provide them, right? So I can provide the instance of the option uh, of the monad error for option and throwable. And those are all the methods I have to implement. So, so point is from applicative, bind is from bind, those to create monad, and those, this is from, from monad error. So I have to create all this crap, and I understand it is crap, it is boilerplate, right? But it's in one, in, one single, in one single place. Obviously, I have only one single slide, right? But in your project, you would have that thingy in one single place, the crapness, the ugliness in one place and everything else would be sort of clean and, and nice. Um, we have, we could, we, uh, yeah, it, it will work so, so if, if there was an error, it will give you uh, an option back. If, if uh, sorry, if there wasn't an error, it will just give you value back closed over an option. If error actually occurred because this froze an exception, it will just ignore the error and give you none. Um, and we could do exactly the same thing for, for try. We could also implement, mm, monad error instance for try and throwable with all those methods that we have to implement. And one more time, uh, this will, if we run it right now, it will give us the right results. So we run it for, for either type, uh, for, for task, which we run later on, for option, for try, and we, we run all four of those times a single method where just the user decides which, the, which will be the final type. And, and this will work for success cases, and this will also work for, for failures in this example here, and none, and the last failure in try that we can see, it's also, it's also covered. Because all those, um, all those instances of type classes, they know how to handle the situation where you have to lift the value to that F, or if there was an error of type S, also lift it to the value closed over F. They know how to do it. And, and if you look at it, this is, this is sort of really, really nice. Because right now, you gave back power to the user. The user will use your functions the way they want to use it. They are not you're not constraining them with whatever time that you have. You just say, do whatever you want. Um, but you might be saying, okay, but there's a lot of effort with that. Like there is a lot of this, this cognitive process that I have to understand and oh my God, oh, the moment I have to uh, introduce that to the junior developers I have in my company and I understand that, but think about the alternative. So, I'll, so let me just give you an alternative. The alternative is, let's say you fix on one type. Let's say you wanna handle your errors with either type. Let's, so we're saying like if there's an error, it's gonna be uh, throwable on the left hand side. If it's a value, it's gonna be integer on the right hand side, right? And, but then your, your, your business logic becomes a little bit more complicated. So right now, the values, we're gonna take them from a method environment variable, which takes the name of uh, environment variable and gives you the value. But since it's something that is effectful because it's communicate with, with your operating system, it's closed over task. As you remember, task is just a, like a future plus plus. So now, if I, if I would like to write my function like this, I would like to uh, call environment variable on the first argument. So right now, argument will not hold the, the value. It will just hold the name of the environment, environment variable in the system. And I wanna read that value, and then that value will give me, a, so that the value of that environment variable will be the income. And I wanna use that with my function income task. The tax. This will not compile because we have two different monads and monads do not compose. Well, fortunately, they came up with an idea called monad transformers, which at the beginning, so we have this either T type. If you've never seen either T, it's either T. It's not really that scary. So the idea is if you have this junction, if you have either, but that either is closed over some, uh, some F, whatever that F will, might be, like for example, in our example, that F is gonna be task you might wrap it up over, over either T and, and it will just give, gives you an ability to uh, immediately fetch that value B. It, it kinda, I don't wanna focus on that because of the time constraints. So it's not really the, the, the issue here. I will just show you how ugly that is and, and uh, the ugliness that you will, you will get from it. And, and, and so if, if that sounds like a magic, don't worry about it. 
but we can do it. Like we can, we can lift both the task to, uh, to either type, uh, either T of task and throwable and our value. And you can also, our, our income tax function, so the one that returns either type, we could also lift that to either type. So now we have either T uh, of task here and here. So those are exactly the same monads. So now for comp comprehension works. So we get the income from the environment variable. We get tax from, from calculating the tax. And it all magically works. And it's not that bad. But then you realize, holy shit. Somebody might call this function, right, with a name to a, an environment variable that does not exist in the operating system. So what this thingy will do is it will throw an exception. So you want to you wanna have additional type safety in your type signature. So what, what are you, uh, so this, this is to believe me it works. But, so what, what will you do here is you want to say, well, it's a task because it's doing something that is changing the world, but it will not give me a string. It will give me an option of string. Option meaning if the environment, if the environment variable existed, you will get a value. If it didn't exist, you will get none. So now it's a task of option and string, and, and this, this becomes its own thing. I, I sometimes believe, believe it has its own intelligence, you know, it's like, because it's like either T of option of T of task, and, and then you spend the whole day trying to reason about the code you written two days ago, and it's, and it's just horrible. It's, there's, a, there's, a too, there's too much boilerplate, really. You cannot really uh, remove that boilerplate. It always will exist, but it's, it's just an idea. It would be nice to con concatenate it in one single place, have it this, this ugly box of ugliness in one place, and everything else would be, would be nice uh, in the rest of the code base. Because if you really think about it, that those two are the important things. And all that is, is just, is just the, the madness. I mean, if you've been working with Java before, right, you sort of get used to that boilerplate. You know, oh, I'll just find this. This is, this is the important stuff. And I, and I have my ID. It will, it will remove all that, and it will just work. But I, I, I would say, I, yeah, I, I want to work with languages that don't have to deal with that craziness. So. If our functionality was one more time written using the monad error here, this thing is returning task of option of string. It could, it could as well just return option T of task. Now, well, the first thing stays the same. We, we rise our environment variable to option T, but then we can call our income tax with an option T of task and, and the question mark here. So one more, because at this level, the floor comprehension here, the first line, require us that the value returned by this function will be the option T of task. This is, this is what, we, what we need. And the beauty of this method, the way that it's implemented, is saying, you decide what the type's gonna be, as long as, the, as there is this constraint fulfilled. So we are saying, so the question would be, is there an option, if for option T of task, does there exist a monad error instance? And unfortunately it is in Scala Z. It sort of looks like, uh, it looks like this. There's a little bit of craziness, but the idea is that if you have an um, option T of some F, and that F has an instance of monad error, then you will also get an instance for your option T of that F. So, so if task has an instance of monad error, and it does, then option T of task also has an instance of monad error. So it sort of works. And, and yeah, so we have our values there. So now you see for, we run it for income one, uh, which has a proper value, income two that has an error, and, and there's a does not exist uh, variable that doesn't exist. So we either get a value, an error, or none, because the environment variable did not exist within the system. Um, the client is happy. And it's sort of like, yeah, uh, we're happy as well. Um, now the question is, uh, the next example is gonna be like 20 more minutes. Are you up to for, for more 20 minutes? Or are you just like, let's go have a beer? For people who just, okay, so I have a wife and I know how that is. Like you might be already texted like, come on, it's just the dude from Poland and you know, huh? 
So if you have to go, just go. For people who want to stay, I will be happy to continue. All right, so we have an next client, Princess Leia. And our, our sort of like legal department is like, eh, it should be good. Like, it doesn't matter. The, the next client is basically from the other side. And uh, um, Leia, she has an issue, right? The, the rebels, they are really, really, really loyal. They will die for the cause. But it's also an issue. They constantly die. If you watch Star Wars, all the rebels before, be, beside, I, I would say, like Luke Skywalker, they all died. So she's constantly like missing all the ships and, and the crew and all that. And she's like, she needs, to, she needs to have an app to sort of like try to reason about what, what she actually currently has uh, uh, for the revolution. So, so there's like a lot of code here. It's just, uh, yeah, as I, I said, I never create a complex example for, for presentations. This is sort of what I did. and I. I'm not really happy about it, but I just, yeah, stay with me. So there's a gun. Gun has a power, and we have different types of guns, right? Not really that complicated. There's a drive that will run your ship. It has like a attributes like minimal personnel that, that needs, need to operate at a given drive, and also how much fuel you need to provide to that drive for it to, to, to run. And you have two different types of drives, the M drive and hyperdrive, with different attributes. Um, there's a citizen which is the first name and last name, and finally is our spaceship with a name, a captain, which is needed, a drive, a list of personnel, and a f the number of fuel, and the front gun and the rear gun. And we need to, like Princess Leia, need to have this ability to sort of like quickly assemble a spaceship with the crew and ready to go, ready for action. So, so this is what we're gonna do. So we will have like an init, init function that takes a name and takes a captain and takes a drive and creates as a, like an initial spaceship and then we have all those little functions that, that adds additional stuff. So we can either recruit a citizen to be a part of the personnel, we can suck them, we can tank our ship, we can equip the front gun and we can equip the rear gun. So all those functions, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you might imagine like, how do I change state in the functional programming? Well, the only way to change state in functional programming is you take initial, initial uh, you know, state in this example, the ship, spaceship, and, and you give a, a new spaceship back and maybe some value uh, being produced. So for example, if we, if we recruit a person to a spaceship, a new citizen, you get a new spaceship back, but also you get a Boolean information whether it's operational, whether, whether the number of people in the, in the personnel, they have an ability to actually drive that, that spaceship. So, but so, so here we just create a new spaceship by copying the, the personnel, we're adding just the citizen to the personnel list, and we are also checking this condition, whether this is operational, and we return a tuple here. And we do that all for all those little functions. And now, and this is one of the methods that we use in our program, and it sort of assembles a spaceship. So we have a Han a Solo, and we have Chewie, and so we in instantiate a, a, a new Millennium Falcon, a Falcon with Han Solo as, as a captain, and then we recruit a Chewie. So it gives us, so initially we had the spaceship S1, but now after recruiting Chewie, uh, we get um, S2, a new spaceship, and uh, information whether the spaceship is operational. But then we add tank to it, and then we equip the front guard and the rear guard, and always we get those little informations, but also the, cha the state is changing here, right? So the first spaceship, second, third, and so on. And finally, the S3, uh, S6 here is, is our, as our final spaceship, spaceship. And this is what we were supposed to create for Princess Leia, is the status report with whether the spaceship is operational, how much fuel it has, and, and what's the gun power for both guns from the rear and, and from the front. And now if we run it, uh, apparently we, we get an error because uh, we, we equipped that in that example, our, our spaceship with two antimaterial blasters, but we get antimatter blaster in, in front and there's still laser in the back, and the question is why that is. And apparently, well, the, the, the reason for it is the last spaceship here, S6, was, was basically, the, the, this is the last spaceship created, but we made an, ex, uh, an, an error here, the status report, and we gave, gave, gave S5 back. Because if you look at it, like nobody in their mind would write software like that. This, would, this is like so open for errors. You can make all those little mistakes, passing wrong spaceships like here, we're passing the arguments between calls. So if I call with this with S2 instead of S3, compiler will be just happy. Like, yeah, whatever, man, compiles, works. Um, but it doesn't, right? So there's a number of errors that we can provide, and this is just horrible. So uh, 
there's actually, uh, there's actually a way to fix this and it's called a, a state monad. And if you look, so how many of you guys are familiar with, okay, so who's not familiar with state? Uh, there are a few people, okay. So um, yeah, I have a state one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, know, your wives will kill me, your husbands will kill me. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I will run to Poland on Monday, so. Um, yeah, so okay, so state. If you look at state as color Z, if you look at it really, really closely, like really, really, really closely, you will see this. At least this is the first, the first thing I've seen when I, I look at it for the first time. So the, the, the way they implemented it like this, there's a reason for that, but it's too, really too complex to explain state uh, for, to a newcomers. So uh, instead of doing this, let's implement state from our own, from, from the scratch. And it's not really that hard because what is state doing? It's state is just a wrapper, nothing else. It, it, it wraps a function. It's a function that goes from S, whatever the S is, to a tuple S of A. Yes, spoiler alert, S is like our spaceship and, and A is whatever we're producing. Like we're recruiting a person, we take a spaceship and we return a new spaceship and the Boolean value, for example, whether the spaceship is operational, yes or no. So this is what we had before. This, this is what we just seen a moment ago and now we are wrapping it over class. Now, stay with me, why are we doing it? We will see that in a moment, but we were doing it for a reason. Now, we close that thing over S, uh, that function over some state. It would be nice if we could actually also run it. Well, we always have access to this, so we can always run it. Now, we will, we will implement two functions for it. So uh, this apply here is just a convenient function to wrap. So I have some function F and I just wanna create a new uh, instance of, of, of that type uh, of, of state for that, for that F. Now, I want to implement two things. I want to implement map and flat map so I have a monad. And you might be thinking, holy shit, this is going to be complex, right? And the cool thing about functional programming is that even if you don't know what you're doing, and it's basically me like majority of times, you just have to follow types and, and it's sort of like implementation will appear in front of your eyes and it's going to be all, the only one implementation that you need to have. And I, because of the time constraints and all that, I, I'm, I'm not gonna really focus on that a, a lot. I'm just give you a general overview. If you guys have questions, you'll have my email or whatever. The slide's gonna be online so you can, you can, you can sort of um, do your homework and try to reason about it with, uh, with your momentum, with your tempo. But just here, check this out. Um, I will just quickly show you a map and flat map is something similar. We wanna implement a map function. So we have a, we have a function that goes from S to SA, it's close over this object, state SA. And now we will have a function G that goes from A to B and gives us a state of S, B, right? So even if we don't have the, yet the imagination of what map should be doing and how we should implement it, we could just basically try to follow the type. So I need state S, B. How I can create state S, B? Well, there is a function that will give me S of, of something. Right? I just have to wrap this S to SB and, and, and this will work. So I can just, I can just use that constructor. Uh, sorry, I can just use that constructor here, the state SB, and I have to wrap a function that will go from S and will give me a back a tuple of S and B a new S and B. So I not, now need two things, B and new S, okay? Where can I get B from? Well, there's only one place where I can get B from, right? If I call G, I will get B, correct? Well, let's, let's call G. So I'm calling G with, well, I can only call, can only call G with A. Where I can get A from? Well, there's only one place A is actually mentioned. It's here. It's my function F. Why, if I call my F, I will get a new S and some A, and I need, right now, at this point, I need A. So if I call my F, I will get some S1 here and my A. Okay, so I need to call my F with something, with S, but I already have an S. Is that S0, right? And at the very, very end, I need a new state, but it's already here as one. Map implemented, done. And the only way that you can implement map in, 
at least for that uh, um, way that we constrain our state here. So that's the only implementation, and you created it by just following types. And sort of flat map, flat map looks exactly the same. Uh, I'm not going to do it, as, as I said, a homework for you guys. So now the difference here is that, and I know you're slow, slowly falling asleep, but I, okay, I promise, 50 minutes, okay? 50 minutes of your focus, and I promise you beer, okay? Just, just stay with me because I have absolutely, I, I, I understand there's a like, lot of code, and, and your brain is already like going crazy. But check this out. We have all those methods that were taking initially, initially some ship and some additional values. They were giving us a new spaceship and some value being created. This is exactly from S to SA. So without much of work, without, with just wrapping this function over our state, we can change, change this type signature to something like this. You, you see there's not a lot of difference here. So the difference is our passing a new state and getting a state back is closed over this type signature. So now our, all our functions are returning us a fun, um, sorry, a, 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 an object of type state spaceship to whatever the value is, but we didn't do a lot. We just took the initial function that took the ship, did some magic to it, and we just wrap it over a state. Nothing else so far. And if you really think about it, this is really, really lazy at this point, because if you call recruit here, you only get, you think of it as a recipe, like, what should happen if somebody actually at some point will call this function with some argument? It's not doing anything yet. It's sort of like a lazy evaluation at this point, but every, each of those elements will, will, will give you those little steps in your final recipe. So now our final solution that we had in the main method, which all this craziness where we were passing state around and we could just pass the wrong state here or, or push it as a wrong value here and all that, we can now, because state is a monad, we can use for comprehension. So now, this has changed a little bit. So the difference here is, all those little, all those little small recipes, they build the final recipe of, of how we assemble a ship, right? With little elements here and there, and we have the values that are being evaluated on the left-hand side, but there is no state no more being passed around because that state the transition of a state is implicitly passed between calls for you in a way that we implemented a map and, 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 and flat map. So we don't pass any state around, the state is being passed for us implicitly and we only focus on the things that are sort of important. Now, I've shown this uh, presentation on the conference in Poland a few months ago and the response that I got from one guy was like probably a Java developer he tweeted this, like uh, I think he tweeted uh, actually this, and he said, oh, so this is how you do builder pattern in Scala. And I'm like, no, okay, so one more time. I'm sort of constrained with the examples I can show. If, if I would, like, builder pattern, you can do it a lot easier and simpler in Scala. It's builder pattern is basically built within the language, right? You don't have to do, use additional libraries whatsoever. State is, is sort of more their building pattern, but, uh, Mm, um, but we are just show only showing just, just the pieces of it that we actually need, uh, need at this point. But if, if you have those thoughts like, oh, this is so super complicated and I could just do it differently, um, yeah, but it's still state gives you a lot more power, which I'm not focusing on it right now. But, um, but yeah, so we have this for comprehension. And finally, so this is not giving us any shape whatsoever. It, it's only giving us a recipe. Once you give me some initial spaceship, I will run all those little steps for you and give you all the values that you need. So the question whether it's operational, how much fuel and gunpowder, and the final spaceship. And this is what we are doing at the very end. Here the recipe, it has the, the, the run method. So basically run calls our function that is, is hidden here, wrapped here within that recipe and you run it with some initial, initial spaceship. And that initial spaceship goes through all those steps here, gives us the final spaceship and all the values that we sort of need. And yes, yeah, so this was a lot of uh, introduction to a state monad, uh, uh, so just to so understand the ugliness that is coming. 
So because right now it all looked pretty and we had that demo with Princess Leia and she's excited, everything she's, is working, but she's like, yeah, I forgot to tell you really that the crew, we're gonna like, we, we run out of humans and now we will just, I will just handle uh, all the citizens will be Wookiees. And so you have a, you have a function Wookiee um, that gives you, that gives you a citizen um, like a Wookiee here. And it's either, there's like an error, Wookiee is not available, or it will give you a Wookiee back. In, in this example, like Chewbacca is always given back and that, that's all you have basically. Now, if you try to use that with this, so no longer you have Chewie here, you have to fetch a citizen to recruit using that, that method, we get one more time the horror, right? One more time the ugliness of raising everything up and it's not over because Princess Leia has this idea about a status report that we should actually return and also that status report, we, we sort of should keep the reports of that status report within the spaceship. So it's, she's like lifting everything that we can possibly think of and it's just, it's just becoming super, super ugly because yes, yeah, status report, like now you have to, depending, like if the ship is operational, then you return a new status report uh, and with information whether it's operational and, and if it's not, you return an error ship is not operational because this is what your, what your type signature is telling. You will either return a new ship with a status report or, or an error back. And, and, and sort of for everything to work, you have to do that all that bullet right here. And it's just horrible. And so, so there's a, so luckily, and, and I, will, I will try to wrap it up. Um, yeah, so, so you, because you could, one thing you could try to do is sort of like with those super long types, like either T of state of spaceship or Jesus Christ, whatever that is, and I don't remember what that is. You can, you can sort of like try to reason about it, providing some uh, type aliases. So you would say there's an error, there's a ship state. So it's basically a state of spaceship. And you could say that there's a ship state error, which is either T of, of ship state and all that. It will sort of help with type signature here, but it will not hel help you with this. This will still be crazy. Um, so now, if we, if, but the question is, and you guys, okay, so how many of you guys here are software engineers? Like, raise your hand, you call yourself. Okay, so majority, and, and if we run it, it, it works. So the question is, should we ship it? <laughs> All right? Yeah, you know, it's Friday, you know. <laughs> Uh, th you should always follow this motto, motto like uh, always code as the person who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath who knows where you live. You know? <laughs> I know I got the scars. Um, so yeah, so let's try to before we, we and I, I promised 15 minutes so I have like, I think like three. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's try to make it a little bit easier and then so let's, let's go back to this. So this, before the craziness happened, uh, we still had this nice signature here. Everything was working. We were using state. We were using state and everything was cool until Princess Leia came up with an idea. We should get Yuki, Wookiee, but Wookiee can be written as a, either an error or we get actually a Wookiee back. So, uh, and we had this state over here. But actually, if, if we look into Scala Z, we will find there's something called monad state. And the same way as a monad error, monad state is saying like, I have the ability to put state and, and give you some F back, or I can give you a state back from, from this thing and, and has the signature that method S to SA, it all exists, but it's not really, it's saying that this can be a state, but it can be, an, it can be anything else as well. You maybe have state T, state E also has an instance for monad state. So you're saying whatever type class is like, you see a pattern, there are different type classes, they have a similar pattern, so, you can, so, so you can sort of um, reuse um, types, they have similar patterns, so you can sort of reuse that pattern, so you don't really have to fix on state, on maybe either T of state, or whatever the type you're using. For now, you're just saying, if I have a function that goes from S to SA, give me an F back, and I don't really wanna know what that F is, and this is what we're doing over here. So, uh, so here, instead of returning a state monad, we will be returning, we will be returning uh, an F. 
So we are returning f of boolean, f of you know yeah int or int here for the for the gun power because we're saying I'm not sure if it's going to be state. It might be something else. As long as that thing that f here is is, is constrained with monad state, as long you, you give me this when you call me, I'm happy. So the only difference here is that we, st we still close our function that goes from ship to a new ship and some value. We still close it over something, but we are not fixating ourselves. We aren't, we aren't using a concrete type like state. We're saying some f. I don't know what f yet. The user will decide, but they are, so, they are a little bit constrained of what they can use. As long as their f will have this constraint will have instance for the type class, everything is fine. So from, some, from here, from this perspective, this for comprehension where we still are, we're using state, it's looking exactly the same as it is looking before. We're just, we're just saying, you know, use, use basically state. It will work, it will work just fine with, with this ship state, meaning the state of, of spaceship. Everything is the same, but now when Leah comes with this crazy idea, take citizens from Wookiees, but you might get an error, you're saying, yeah, I'm fine, right? So I'm not saying it has to be an error. It has to be a disjunction. I'm using my monad error. So I'm saying I will return some f that ha ha knows how to deal with errors. So in this example, now the unified type will be the either t of spaceships and all that, but we can call our functions by just saying what the final type is going to be, and this for comprehension will still work. So there's still somebody who is doing all the heavy lifting, all the boilerplate and all that, but most probably it's Scala Z. And you just use whatever the business logic that you have within your function, and you don't really have to care at this point. And and I said, I have said 15 minutes, I have two minutes, I'm wrapping this up. Uh, it basically works, believe me, uh, status report, or a report as well. So status report was, had, this, uh, had this case, either, either there's, its ship is operational, then return a state, uh, or there was an error, then raise an error. And we're constraining ourselves with monad error and monad state, and, and this should sort of work. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. It compiles with an error, and the reason for that is, if you look it up, that the error that we get here, it's saying uh, uh, ambiguous implicit values, and it's saying, I'm, I was supposed to get an applicative uh, for point, but I have two different things that will give me that, uh, that point functionality, both monad state and monad error. And the reason for that is, uh, if we look at the type signature, monad state extends monad, and, and monad error also extends monad. And it's, and it's sort of a pain in Scala with, uh, when we use MTL. And so fortunately, there are ways to, to work around it, not really nice. So one way to work around it is just create a monad error underscore which doesn't extend monad because monad isn't really needed here. Uh, and then you will have a nice conversion between, so given I have, given I have a monad error underscore, uh, so given I have a monad error and I need a monad error underscore, I have this implicit conversion that will do that for me. It's a little bit thing ugly. It's just, it's just the way the way ScalaZ is implemented and both cats. Uh, ScalaZ 8 is trying to fix that, but they are still like sort of in the middle of, of, of trying to implement this. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of pain, but it's not really that much pain. You just have to create those little workarounds in your code base and and have to be aware they, they sort of exist. And, and then things will compile and things will work. So Princess Leia is happy. We have our functionality. So, so the, the number of those type classes that you have when you can use from ScalaZ is enormous, like, like Monad Listen, Monad Splash, Monad Reader, Monad Tell. And uh, as an exercise, if you, if you, sort of, you want to do an exercise after this talk, I really recommend doing a, a thing like, um, Create three functions. Create one function that that returns a value, but it's also it's logging some stuff. So so a writer. Create another function that that returns some stuff, but um, but an er er error like uh, like either type. And the third one will be state. 
and then try to write a four comprehension for it. Live through the hell of it, right? Survive, and then try to implement that using MTL. And you will, you will see that, uh, you will just see the butterflies and you'll be happy like everything was gonna be awesome because you will just, all the ugliness will hide behind the library and your code will, will be pure. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Some of you guys might be wondering what happened to our startup that we were running. Well, well basically we were acquired by uh, Angel Investment and everything worked fine. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much guys.